Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Facebook Live session. We're so excited to be here with you today. My name is Dr. Angela Sue, and I'm a board certified geriatrics and internal medicine physician with the Mid Atlantic Permanente Medical Group here in Northern Virginia. I'm joined today with some incredible colleagues, Dr. Gennaro Hernandez and Naraj Mandarada, who practice in Baltimore and the DC suburban Maryland region. And we're really excited today to share with you some ways to improve your mental and physical health as we age and discuss things like risk factors for dementia, tips on caregiver support, life care planning, all really important things, whether you're in your 50s, 60s, um, or beyond, or just love someone or know someone who is. So we're here to share some advice with you that we're hoping will improve your health and your happiness at any age. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves briefly first so you get to know the panel and we're happy to um, accept any questions you have from the group as, um, as you're watching our program. So please send them in the, the comments and we'll try to address as many as we can. So to start with, my name again is Dr. Angela Su, and I'm a board certified geriatrician. I um, see patients um, with the memory care program here in the Tyson's Corner location in Northern Virginia. And I'm also a primary care doctor um, who practices at Kaiser for the last seven years or so. So um, I'd like to also introduce Gennaro Hernandez, um, who's one of the other physicians on our panel today. Hi, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Hernandez. I'm uh, also a board certified internal medicine geriatrics. I actually practice in primary care in the Abingdon office, and then I do uh, mem uh, our memory care program in South Baltimore uh, once a week. Uh, so happy to be on, on the call. <clears throat> and next we have Dr. Naraj Mandarada. Hi everybody, thank you, Dr. Sue. I'm Naraj Mandarada. I am a board certified internal medicine physician. I practice in the hospital system and the post-acute care system. I've been with the medical group for about 10 years now. Happy to be here with all of you. Great, thank you guys so much. So again, um, please enter any questions you have that you'd like us to answer in the chat, um, in the comments section, and we'll try to address them during our session today. So we have a few questions that were sent to us in advance that we'd like to start off with, and we'll kind of go through these and anything else that comes up. So one of the first questions I want to go over we received um, is a question about memory. So the question is, my memory is not as good as it used to be. What's normal and when should I start worrying about it? And I'm sure as we get older, this is something all of us have been thinking about and we hear it a lot in our clinics um, from people of all ages. And you know, the basic truth is that your brain is just like any other part of your body and it's gonna age as you do. So it's not necessarily a disease process like Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia, but it's a natural lifelong process, this cognitive aging that's going to occur with everyone. So one thing you want to keep in mind, we hear a lot about memory, but memory is really just one part of what our brains do for us. There are so many other cognitive domains, um, as we call them, including things like attention, understanding, problem solving, um, making decisions, thinking and processing. These are all things that our brains manage for us and all of these areas um, and our abilities in these areas can change as we get older. So you know, of course, what normal cognitive aging looks like for every person is going to be a little bit different. Um, but I just want to cover some normal things, some common things that we see with as, as we age. So one thing we'll hear a lot is that you're not as quick as you used to be. That processing speed is, is a little bit slower. Um, and that's a normal change with cognitive aging. Um, the other thing we hear a lot is that people have more trouble with attention, not like attention deficit disorder, but maybe um, trouble with dividing your attention. Multitasking gets a little bit harder or filtering out distractions um, when you're trying to do a task. Those things can be harder than um, they were before. The other thing people mention a lot is short-term memory loss. So, you know, why did I walk into this room? What am I here for? Or um, remembering kind of recent events or kind of details around events, those things might get a little bit fuzzier. But generally, even though short-term memory might be a little bit worse, we would expect that long-term memory is generally relatively preserved. The other thing that people say a lot when we're talking about memory is word finding difficulties, you know, trouble thinking of that actor's name or, or this word that, you know, you're trying to say, but it's just at the tip of your tongue. So, you know, word finding difficulties definitely become common and can be a normal part of aging. Um, although, you know, with even with these language difficulties, we would expect things like your comprehension of words to be still not getting worse. You can still understand what you're trying to say, but maybe just have trouble pulling it out. 
And then, of course, some things, um, some aspects of executive function, planning, organizing, decision making might get a little bit more difficult. Um, but, the, you know, we wouldn't expect it to really impair your ability to function in your daily life. Um, this is when we start thinking about things that are um, not just normal cognitive aging, you know, the degree to which we experience any of these symptoms is going to depend on a lot of factors, including your genetics, your overall health status, um, your baseline levels of education and function and other things going on in your life, like stressors, your mood, substance abuse, how you're sleeping, but generally speaking, um, changes with normal cognitive aging, while they're noticeable, and they might require you to make some adjustments and how you do things. Um, in normal aging, they shouldn't be progressing to the point where they're affecting your ability to function. Um, and if that's occurring, it's definitely something you want to talk to your doctor about. All right, so that's a little bit on normal cognitive aging. Um, and that kind of segues into one of the next questions we have, which is what everyone wants to know right after that, which is what can I do? What can I do to keep our minds sharp? And so I'm going to throw this to um, Dr. Hernandez to kind of give us some advice on what we can do to preserve our minds as we get older. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, Dr. Sue. And I think that was a Great introduction on what is a uh, you know, normal cognitive, uh, you know, uh, function and, and as you age, and I think all of our, regardless of age, we want to keep our minds sharp. And one of the things that I that I really stress when I see patients uh, in the office and especially in, in our memory care program is I have a saying, and that saying is whatever is good for your heart is also good for your brain, and so that includes three things. One is exercising very important. And I'll go into the details of each. Number two, eating healthy. And number th three, keeping mentally active. And so if I may speak about being mentally active, I think now that we're slowly heading out of this, uh, of, of the pandemic and more people are vaccinated, social, social interaction is so important in keeping uh, mentally engaged. And I think now that, uh, um, a plug-in to get vaccinated if you are not, is that uh, as per the CDC's guidelines, um, you know, if you're vaccinated and you have other family members who are vaccinated, you can, you know, uh, gather together. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, social interaction is very important, whether it be in person or on the telephone or on Facebook portal, Zoom, what have you. Keeping that connection um, is so important in keeping uh, you mentally healthy and also emotionally healthy. And that, and that, uh, is one in the same. Other things you can keep mentally active, things like reading, simple things like reading, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, even knitting as well, those type of things. Um, <clears throat> other things that I've seen uh, people deal with a lot because of the pandemic social isolation is anxiety and depression. So if you're having some of those symptoms, it's important for you to get treated for anxiety and depression, whether it be through talk therapy or even medications. Those are, those are so important. And the things that, that I think keeping mentally sharp, I often get questions on, you know, hey, is there a supplement I can take that will, you know, reverse any issues and I don't have to worry about anything. But honestly, the answers are right in our backyard. So um, those three things I had mentioned, but also too, is just basically keeping control of your underlying health issues. So for example, uh, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease are all risk factors for dementia. And then keeping those in check and under control, visiting your primary care doctor to make sure those are in check, making sure your cancer screenings are in check, you know, all these things uh, play a role in your mental health. Other thing I will say this as well um, is one thing with, with aging is your hearing uh, goes, especially with um, uh, uh, high pitched tones, having your hearing checked if there are any issues with hearing is very important. Um, two last things I want to say as far as like keeping uh, mentally active is one, I think all of us, um, many of us are caregivers for other people. And oftentimes we care for other people, but we forget about ourselves. And the one plug in I would say is you always got to remember to take care of yourself. Okay. Because, um, and, uh, and that's a, and I'm glad if you're attending this, this is a part of you caring for yourself because you're learning about how to care for yourself. Some of the things um, that, I, that I will mention that helps me as far as keeping mentally act, uh, 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 sharp is meditation. I actually use the, the, the uh, uh, app that I got through Kaiser for free called uh, Calm. And so you go to kp.com and then you can find that. And also My Strength is another app. app. Eating healthy, I'll just mention this. I won't go into too much de detail, but basics I teach patients, eat less, 
less fried foods, increase of vegetables and fruits. Uh, those are the basic things. And then, and then for exercise, um, you don't need to go and pay a high prices at a gym. I mean, going for a walk is enough. Playing with your grandkids, whether it be ball, um, you know, going on a walk with your with, with your um, uh, with your family members. Those 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 simple things. Salt uh, dancing, whether you like salsa, merengue, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then uh, just a plug in that if if anyone. Uh, is interested. It's actually uh, like there's brain games that you can do. We're talking about keeping mentally you know, sharp. You can actually check out kp.brainhq.com. That's kp.brain, H is in Henry, Q is in quail.com. So, um, uh, so. Thanks, Dr. Hernandez. It's a lot of great tips. Um, I think, you know, the Kaiser portal has a lot of great resources as well on exercise options if you haven't checked them out. I think with your Kaiser insurance you get um, free online access to the class pass program and so that's a lot of streaming classes that you can get and discounts on in-person classes as well. Um, there might also be depending on your plan you know um, programs at gyms that are discounted. Um, there are um, some great programs through our thriving after 60 program. I know there are some online dance parties that were really popular and hundreds of people were logging on and getting down to some really good music um, so they get to see other people and enjoy themselves while they're getting moving so there's lots of great resources out there if you're not sure but the weather's getting nicer it's a great way to get out so I really love how Dr. Hernandez emphasized that um, and of course the taking care of yourself is so important um, so make sure that you're mentally and physically strong if you're a caregiver to take care of um, everyone in your life. All right, so um, moving on from that, I think some really good preventative talk. Another thing we like to do is to really think in advance. So prevention medically, but also some advanced care planning. So let's let's have Dr. Menderata talk to us a little bit about kind of when you should start life care planning and, and some advice for that, because it seems to be confusing for a lot of people. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, we have made some significant strides in mid-Atlantic states uh, with a focus on what we call dignified journey. Um, uh, it's a good, easy way to remember it. Over the age of 18, focusing on all adults starting at the age of 18, and then really dividing into four different classes, our seriously ill population, those that have multiple comorbidities, um, they have heart failure, they have kidney failure, or close to it, um, COPD, other significant diseases processes. Um, also, when they get into the hospital and they need specialty palliative care, or if they're way too advanced and need hospice, really our focus here is to focus on a healthy adult population. Think of life care planning or advanced directives as a part of your routine medical maintenance or healthcare. Um, and it's really life care planning advanced directive is a legal document. It's a document that, that clearly states what you would like for your own health. In an instance, you can't make decisions for yourself. And the second most important thing about this is that you have a healthcare agent, that you've discussed this with someone, your loved one, somebody you trust, somebody who you trust to care and uh, make decisions on your behalf if you can't make decisions for yourself. We made this almost seamless at this point. So for, for our audience that's joined on this, on this chat today, if you go to kp.org, simply go into kp.org, go under medical records and go under life care planning. You'll see three different booklets, one for Maryland, one for DC and one for Virginia. You can upload that, just download it into your computer, print it out, spend some time looking through it, fill it in and scan it right back into your medical records. It's pretty seamless at this point. And the whole intention behind this is that we want this to speak for you in an event you can't speak for yourself. So we, we've really tried to simplify this. The Life Care Planning Advanced Directive is more than just some documents you would fill in if you got really sick and you went to the hospital, but it's really gauges you and all the other things that are really important about you, what you wish, how you live, what you enjoy. It really tells a story about you. And certainly I think we see this as physicians all the time. When patients come into the hospital, they're really sick. And when you are sick and you can't make decisions for yourself, you may be getting heroic measures or a lot of poking and prodding in the hospital setting that you may have not wanted. We wanna really avoid this and fulfill your wishes. So 
I really encourage everyone that's joined today to go to kp.org and look up life care planning. Mm. Thank you so much. It really has been such a game changer for a lot of people to be able to have these conversations in advance. Um, can you talk a little bit about what decision support tools there are, you know, because I think sometimes just starting the, the discussion and, you know, knowing what to talk about and what to ask about and what to think about can be so challenging. Absolutely. I think that's a great question. And, and you know, our entire medical group is focused on this initiative of having these conversations, being open to these conversations, engaging in these conversations, and putting together tools for our patient population and our physicians to have these ongoing conversations. We have life care planning training coaches uh, that are available. We have online virtual classes. I would love for our audience members to engage your physicians in uh, having you refer to these classes. We are actually in a process of advertising a lot of this to our patient population. You'll hear about this in email. You'll hear this on, um, you'll get pamphlets in the mail about this. Take your time, look through it. But I really would, the biggest resource you have is yourself and your loved one. Have these conversations early so it's not too late when you end up in the hospital or the emergency room. Great, great. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the advanced part of this is so important. As Dr. Menderata said, when you're in, when you're sick is not the time to be having big, serious discussions. And if something happens and your family's making decisions for you, this is such a gift that you can give to them to have had made some of these tough choices in advance or at least had conversations about what you want. So, you know, the burden for them is lifted and they can really focus on being there for you. So that's such an important piece. Thank you so much, Dr. Menderata, for working on that. Okay, so um, transitioning from the advanced directives, you know, one place that's really important is, of course, if you have some memory loss, and we talked a little bit about what normal cognitive aging might look like for all of us. Um, one of the other questions we have is, you know, what what would be some signs of an early dementia more than just normal cognitive aging? And um, that would make us worry more that there's another underlying process there. Um, Dr. Hernandez, can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sue. So some of the things that, um, that are, uh, can alarm you uh, or make you more concerned is um, when we, when we look at, dementia and as far as the severity of dementia, we look at issues with self-care or which are known as activities of daily living and then uh, things that are a little bit more higher functioning called um, <clears throat> instrumental activities of daily living. So when we start getting concerned with early signs of dementia, when we look at instrumentals activity of daily li living, those are like cooking, cleaning, paying bills and driving. And when we start having issues, let's say when some, if, if one of you or your loved one has been doing their bills for, for, for the longest time and, and um, had no issues, but then now we're starting uh, to, to double pay things, having late bills. Um, and even um, what we see now, there actually has been a couple of studies showing that those who are, um, are <clears throat> vulnerable to uh, scams is also a beginning sign of, of cognitive impairment. Um, and so when we're looking at the early signs, some of the things that we were most able to do before, whether it be we were a, uh, that you're, you or your loved one um, were able to cook and prepare dinners for, for, large, for large crowds, um, um, you know, pre-pandemic, I guess, uh, you're no longer able to do that, no longer able to process and do those things. I think also too, um, it is not one of these things where I forget my neighbor's name or uh, I left my key somewhere, but it's one of these things where you're forgetting your, your, your one daughter's birthday consistently um, or <clears throat> you're forgetting appointments frequently. Um, and those are some of the, the, the big things to, to be, um, you know, uh, or, and also too with driving. Driving is very important. Are you getting, are there multiple fender benders? Um, and, and that actually may not be a cognitive issue. That also may be other issues that you could see with aging, that being your vision and your hearing and also your reaction speed. So, um, you know, when in doubt, engage your physician uh, to talk about some of these issues if, if you are concerned. 
Absolutely. And so, you know, some of these um, symptoms can seem like they're on a spectrum and generally they are between normal aging and something that is becoming a little bit more significant and getting, you know, starting to affect your function, making us worried for dementia. So as, as Dr. Hernandez said, you know, if you're not sure, talk to your doctor about it. It's something that, you know, maybe we can figure out now. Maybe it's something we have to watch over time to see how it progresses. But if you're worried about it, it's absolutely um, the right thing to do to bring it up with your doctor. Um, I want to add a couple of things maybe that we probably don't see in normal cognitive aging that, that we do see in dementia. One of them um, is that um, people who are kind of in the early stages of dementia might have more difficulty keeping track of time or you know time of year, time of day, and that kind of like waking up in the middle of the night thinking it's daytime or you know not knowing what season it is. That's not, that's something even in the pandemic and with quarantine, it's probably not something we'd expect with normal cognition. Um, and you know um, while word finding difficulties I talked about before are pretty common if we're talking about like frequently seen or familiar objects or calling them different names like instead of a watch you're calling it a hand clock that's kind of a you know hiccup in your brain that might suggest something else going on there so again talk to your doctor if you have any questions about what you're experiencing to see um, if anything else needs to be evaluated so I want to move on next we are um, we got a question from our Facebook community um, who's asking about changes related to menopause so um, can you the question reads can you help women who are late 40s early 50s and managing perimenopause my body is changing a lot and it generally seems harder to summon and maintain my energy level maintain weight and body shape and manage anxiety etc oh well, this is a big one this is something that a lot of our patients are going through right now and maybe even more so um, in COVID. And I'll take a shot at this, but if anyone else wants to jump in, please do. Um, but I think that, you know, again, this is what we're alluding to that all of our bodies go through natural changes as we age. And one thing when I really kind of dig in and talk to my patients um, who are in this age group and experiencing these symptoms is, you know, I'm not changing my diet, I'm not changing my exercise, but I don't have the same energy and I don't have, um, you know, I'm gaining weight or um, I can't lose the weight as easily as I used to. And, and, and part of that is like, well, you, you know, your body is going to change and, and over time doing the same things is not necessarily going to get you the same results. And so, you know, there are shifts in your, your hormone levels, and your metabolism that happen naturally over time and your body shape naturally will change over time unless you're really working hard um, and doing something more to maintain it. And so that might mean that your, you know, your diet has to shift. Maybe um, you have to drink less alcohol you have to exercise more than you used to to kind of maintain that same level of energy and fitness that you're accustomed to and that's something that um, takes a lot of effort and takes a big change in your um, schedule um, but that is something that sometimes you know depends on what your priorities are if this is one of the big things you're worried about then changing your routine might um, be necessary um, if there are severe menopausal symptoms that you're experiencing like really bad mood changes or hot flashes things that are interfering with your sleeping i think it's really important to talk to your gynecologist to see whether um, you're a candidate for something like hormone replacement if that's even you know going to be helpful for you or other medications that might help with these symptoms as well there, there are several different options that they can discuss with you if you are in this perimenopausal or menopausal stage and having symptoms um, so, you know, there are risks and benefits to all the treatments, but it's really important to have the discussion if this is something that's impacting your quality of life. Dr. Hernandez, any, any yeah, additions to that? Um, just, just to add, that's, I think that was, that's great, Dr. Sweet. Um, and then just to add to that is um, kind of plugging back into really mental health because, mm -hmm. um, you know, our bodies do change when our, when our, um, I'm, I cannot speak as I'm a male, but um, <laughs> But the, um, as, your, as your hormones change, and um, we also need to be just mindful of, of mental health as well, and that causing you know, issues. And with menopause, there are issues with, with, um, with, with um, mood instability and hot flashes. And sometimes what I've talked to some patients is almost killing, um, I was saying killing two birds with one stone, but treating both is sometimes if there is a lot of mood instability, I sometimes... Um, talk to my patients about placing them on what we call an SSRI to also help some of the mood issues as well as um, uh, so some of the hot flashes. Um, so that's just a plug-in for that. And, and also too, I, I like what you had talked about 
um, you know, exercise and uh, mindfulness is another one to, to really help. Um, um, and then obviously if they're severe talking to a gynecologist, I definitely agree with um, hormonal potential. Yeah. Okay, great. So we actually have a couple more questions about dementia coming in. People are wondering about um, whether dementia and Alzheimer's disease are hereditary and what should patients with a family history of dementia or Alzheimer's disease plan to do or look for? Um, for example, if your mom's aunt has dementia, would you also be at risk? Um, Dr. Hernandez, you want to take a first stab at that? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. So one of the things that I try to teach patients is that dementia is an umbrella term. Me saying dementia is like saying, oh, you have a car. Okay, so what type of car do you have? Is it a Toyota? Is it a Honda? Is it a Lexus? The dementia is a, uh, maybe a Mercedes, right? So, um, so dementia is a broad term, it's called an umbrella term. And there are different types of dementia. And one of the most common types of dementia is actually Alzheimer's dementia. Alzheimer's dementia encompasses 50 to 80% of all dementias worldwide. So it was the most common. And it is an abnormal um, increase in protein such as amyloid and tau that get deposited and messes up with your brain cells, okay? The second most common type of dementia is vascular dementia, okay? which is dementia from a stroke or longstanding high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, and uncontrolled diabetes. The other types are much rare, and those are Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia. I don't want to go into all the other ones. But I will say this. When you're looking at Alzheimer's dementia, only 1% of Alzheimer's dementia is genetic. And actually, age is a risk factor of, of dementia. So what I mean by that is that oftentimes I get this question, is it genetic related? And then I, I will say often it's not. And if it is genetic related, it is often related to <clears throat> certain genes that would put you at risk for early stages, uh, early dementia, like developing dementia in your 50s, 60s, not in your 80s or 90s. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing more as you age, the type of dementia is honestly often mixed. So it may be 60% Alzheimer's, 20% vascular, et cetera, et cetera. Poor hearing, you know, th those things are depression. So, um, so to answer that question, it's, it's that it's uh, very seldom that it is genetic. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. And you might see in your family, your aunt has dementia and someone else in your family has dementia. And to some degree, you know, it's not the classic, you know, you have blue eyes, your family's going to have blue eyes type of um, genetics that we're talking about. Because as, as JJ said, do, oh, sorry, Dr. Hernandez said, the, um, you know, it's so common to have dementia as we get older and there's so many different contributing factors to it. So, you know, certain things that can be genetic would be your propensity for high blood pressure or, you know, high cholesterol or strokes or heart disease, which might also increase your risk of vas vascular dementia, right? And so, you know, a lot of those vascular risk factors are genetic and things that you can watch out for. Um, but as we get older, you know, maybe about half of us, if we make it to 85, we'll have some cognitive impairment and have some dementia. So it's a common problem that's not traditionally hereditary. Um, but a lot of the things that you can do if you're worried about dementia are to manage those vascular risk factors um, that we talked about that can lead to one of the most common causes of dementia, the vascular dementia, and that will help lower your risk of dementia overall. Um, let's see, another question on Facebook. So how would you locate physicians who specialize in geriatrics at Kaiser Permanente? So that's a very good question. So there are a few of us practicing in the various service areas right now. Um, most of us have primary roles as primary care doctors and do take primary care patients. Um, I think if you call member services, they'll be able to let you know who has certification in geriatrics. If you go on to um, the Kaiser portal, you'll also be able to search um, for doctors and look at them in the locations you're interested in and it will tell you what our particular areas of interest are. Um, I will say that many of our excellent colleagues who don't have specific specialty training in geriatrics are also very well trained and suited to take care of older adults. Um, but we do, um, as geriatricians at Kaiser, also take on an extra role managing the memory care program. So people who are worried about the memory doing specific evaluations for that in a dedicated practice as well. 
So um, check with member services if you can't find them online. Um, your primary care doctor might also be aware of um, who in your region is practicing um, in addition to Dr. Hernandez and I. Oh, okay. So another question from the audience. Is general anesthesia a significant risk for elderly people? Can it cause long-term cognitive or physical issues? Dr. Menderada, do you feel comfortable answering that one? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Um, uh, general anesthesia um, for, from studies that, that have been done is not a risk. However, medications preoperatively and postoperatively can certainly exacerbate the underlying condition of cognitive impairment or advanced dementia. Uh, one of the things that we do for all patients that are undergoing surgery is really simplify back to basic things and, um, and look at their entire medical profile, including uh, all of their existing comorbidities, or which basically means all the different medical conditions you have, along with all the different medications you're taking. Our goal is to simplify medications and look at the side effect profile prior to and after surgery. In particular, some examples would be uh, pain medications after surgery. If your pain is unbearable, then we'd like to go with some uh, a mild narcotic. But if not, then over-the-counter uh, pain medications would, would, would suffice. Really, uh, the focus is to control those medications prior and after, not, not specifically during the surgery itself or anesthesia itself. Great. Um, one of the things that our older patients we know are at risk of, you know, if they're in the hospital for any reason, not just surgical procedures, is also, you know, delirium, right? And so delirium is an acute change of mental status that can occur with any stressor on the brain. And people with cognitive impairment are at higher risk of delirium, but even people with normal baseline cognition can experience delirium depending on what kind of stress the brain is under. So the surgery itself, um, or just being in a different environment or being in a hospital where there's beeping all night and you can't sleep, these are all things that can cause you to become a little bit delirious. Um, and we know that people who experience delirium can have a decline in their cognitive and physical status. Delirium is an, a risk factor for a functional decline after um, the episode. Um, and so really trying to pay attention, to, as Dr. Menderata said, to all the risk factors and medications that can contribute to this, and also trying to get someone back to their normal environment as quickly and po as possible can kind of minimize um, the risk of delirium, how prolonged it is, and what kind of prolonged impact that has. Absolutely. And then we have another question for our audience. Um, is general, oh, sorry. Um, another question was, can you discuss colonoscopy options or colon cancer screening options for someone with no family history that requires less downtime or medications? Dr. Hernandez, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, one of the, the great tests that, that uh, this actually data actually initially came from the, uh, the UK um, and when they did um, uh, what we call FIT tests, fecal immunochemical tests, which basically test for minuscule amounts of blood. And if that is positive, then you need a colonoscopy, okay? And so that is the initial screen for, uh, for if you are, who are average risk for colon cancer. So the first test that, that we do here at Kaiser, um, and actually not even at Kaiser, um, at several institutions, and even worldwide, um, the, one of the first line screenings is uh, what we call the FIT test. And that needs to be done every year, okay, for, for average risk patients. Typically now we're starting to screen uh, at 45 rather than 50. We've seen some data to support that. The other things that are available, uh, which is not covered by, you know, you know insurance, uh, is the, um, the stool DNA test. Uh, that, that test, uh, some of the challenges with that test, you need a, a much larger stool sample. Um, but the positives that is that that's every uh, three years. And so you may see commercials about that. The other ones that are um, not great for, um, well, they are a part of the screening guidelines is a CT colonography, or well, basically a CAT scan that, um, that, um, that can take a look at the colon. The challenges with that is that you have to take the same prep to do a colonoscopy. Then you get a CAT scan. And if they find a polyp, they may have to do a colonoscopy anyway. So you end up taking that prep twice. And so those are the challenges with that. Uh, and then uh, for those who, have, who are, are not average risk, uh, we would look at a colonoscopy 
Um, so if you had a prior polyps, uh, or if you have a history of multiple family members having polyps, or you had a, a, a first degree relative, mother, brother, father, um, I'm sorry, uh, mother, father, brother, sister who had colon cancer, depending on the age that they were diagnosed, you may need to be screened earlier. So, um, so hopefully that, um, um, that answers your, your question. So fit test is the way to go. Thank you so much. And if you've been a member of Kaiser for long enough, I'm sure you've received um, fit tests in the mail um, when you become of age, as, as Dr. Hernandez said, we're now um, starting screening with that for, at um, 45 instead of 50. So um, even those in their late 40s might start seeing a little package in the mail, really easy test to do. And if you do it once a year, it's as good as a colonoscopy to screen for colon cancer in low risk populations as, as Dr. Hernandez described. So if you have any questions about colon cancer screening, it's always an individualized decision. So talk to your primary care doctor if you're not sure which one's right for you. And of course, if you're having any bowel symptoms, bleeding, pain, changes in your bowel habits, then we wouldn't be talking about routine screening anymore. We're talking more about diagnostics and that's something you wanna to talk to your primary care doctor about as well. All right. So let's see, I think we're getting down on the questions in time. Um, I guess in the last few minutes, Dr. Um, Mandarata, do you wanna give us any tips for caregivers out there who might be taking care of a loved one and yeah. how they can help manage this time? Thank you, Dr. Sue. Um, yeah, so caregiver fatigue or burnout, known phenomenon in medicine. Um, uh, we've known about it. W we've learned ways to uh, therapy it. Uh, but certainly been exacerbated by the pandemic, not just for our, our caregivers, the ones that are at bedside or at home taking care of our patients, not just with dementia, but all other diagnosis, especially in a, during the peak of the pandemic when you couldn't get into the hospital to see your loved ones. Sometimes you didn't know how they were doing in the skilled nursing facility uh, or long-term care units. And, and this really attributed to a lot of, uh, of, of care giver burnout and stress. So really the way I look at it, and I think Dr. Hernandez um, hinted on a few, few therapies for this earlier, is to take care of yourself before you can take care of your loved ones. Really, like if you're in, a, if you're in an airplane, you put on your oxygen mask first, and then you do to the next uh, person next to you. A few simple things. Uh, take some time for yourself. Um, so Dr. Hernandez mentioned exercise. Ideal time of exercise would be getting outside if it's a beautiful day. Go enjoy nature for about 30 to 45 minutes if you can. If you don't have the time, take about 10 minutes and just meditate. Just take 10 minutes and meditate. We also talked a little bit about diet. Diet is huge, we don't realize it, but eat clean, drink a lot of water, hydrate yourself, and, um, and interact with people, talk to people. If you have plants, talk to your plants. It doesn't matter, just have <laughs> conversations throughout the day. And one of the things that we really learn is schedule your time. So if you have time for yourself in your calendar, block off 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just solely for yourself. And then the rest of the day will go to what you do and what you're doing already. Remember, all of these things are designed to affect you physiologically. These are not just antidotes that we've learned along the way, but really decrease your stress hormones, your cortisol and your, and your, and your, and your hormones and your blood. So you could feel better and you can actually take care of the people that you're supposed to be taking care of. So really those, those four or five things are instrumental in caregiver fatigue and burnout. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's a known phenomenon, but you can't take care of your family members or your loved ones if you don't take care of yourself. Thank you so much, Dr. Menderata. So I'm hearing a lot of recurring themes here from the yeah. doctors on our panel. Rather than pushing medications, we're talking about self-care lifestyle changes, um, healthy lifestyle is so critical. So that is so important for prevention, which is one of our big emphasis here at the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. So it looks like we've answered all of our questions from our audience and um, I guess we'll wrap up now. So I really wanna thank all of you guys for joining us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends. You can follow us um, online at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram. You can learn a lot more about us and the integrated medical group that we have practicing here um, in your best interest. And you can find out lots more health information on our blog at Kaiser. Um, kp.org backslash doctor. Um, and, you know, the Kaiser portal is a really great resource for all of you. So from all of us here at the Permanente Medical Group, thank you so much and be well. Bye.